My name is Alex Graham. I am uh, the chair uh, of Sheffield Doc Fest. And so I'd like to welcome you all uh, this afternoon. Um, I can't think of a Sheffield uh, in recent years that's taken place amidst such uncertainty uh, about the future ecology of uh, UK broadcasting. The two largest organisations, two most important organisations as far as I think probably all television program makers, but certainly factual television program makers, uh, their, uh, are, are, their futures are still uh, in the balance. Uh, we have a white paper uh, from the government uh, expressing its uh, views on uh, um, the Royal Charter, uh, the next Royal Charter, which will be um, uh, agreed and signed this autumn. Um, uh, but there's still a lot to discuss and play for in that white paper. Uh, about the future of the BBC. I mean, much has been talked about governance and the licence fee, uh, which are obviously really important issues, but there are also um, headline issues around the notion of distinctiveness, uh, and we possibly will debate what that means uh, uh, today. Um, distinctiveness and indeed impartiality, which are obviously big issues for factual programme makers. At the same time, Channel 4 has now had a sword of Damocles hanging over its head for... Um, six months or more, uh, and as we understand, the Secretary of State um, uh, is not going to make a decision uh, for some time, at least well after we know the results of the Brexit vote. So that sort of Damocles is not going away anytime soon. So it's a, an opportunity for us uh, to try to unpack and understand some of the issues um, uh, around uh, the future of the BBC and Channel 4, and indeed, uh, we may well end up talking more broadly about public service broadcasting. To help us do that, we have a, I think I'm allowed to say, a distinguished panel. I'm going to stand over here so you can see them all. Um, in the middle, we have uh, chairing, this, chairing the discussion is Jane Martinson, who's the head of media at The Guardian. Uh, on my uh, immediate uh, left, uh, Hugh Harris is director of media policy at the DCMS. Uh, next to Hugh is Alison Kirkham, acting controller of factual commissioning at the BBC. Uh, on uh, uh, Jane's uh, left, Ralph Lee is uh, Deputy Chief uh, Creative Officer of Channel 4. And uh, I, don't, I don't think the rest of the panel would mind me saying, last but not least, uh, but last but not least, uh, um, uh, on my far left, um, uh, uh, Lord Putnam, uh, who has uh, been uh, chairing uh, the inquiry into the future of public service television. I'm sure I don't need to tell you a distinguished uh, filmmaker uh, in his own right. So uh, I'm not going to take up any more time. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Jane, um, and uh, let's get going. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thank Alex. Um, I think I can honestly say I've been writing about media for a long time, but the past year and a half has been um, some of the most dramatic and really interesting challenges facing public service television in particular, um, with the future of the BBC and Channel 4 um, both being felt to be in the balance in a way that I don't think they have been for a long time, although it's also true to say that questions about public service television have been around since the, um, the creation of BBC uh, 94 years ago, if not uh, even longer. Um, the Royal Charter, the government was elected last May. The Royal Charter has to be renewed by the end of this year because of the way that BBC is governed with a 10-year structure um, to make sure that everything from the way it's funded to the way it's governed um, is, has something in, uh, written down in this charter, uh, which goes before Parliament as in the form of a white paper but is not sort of opened up to a vote. Very, very British um, situation, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, from the appointment of John Whittingdale last May, a few days after the um, general election, which the Telegraph splashed on its front page as a declaration of war on the BBC, I think it's fair to say it has been a, a sort of Game of Thrones-esque battle ever since, um, with the Secretary of State and the BBC themselves either um, sort of helping to justify that headline or indeed denying it um, outright. Um, at the same time, uh, we've, well, we've had the sort of July financial settlement uh, with the Treasury and then last month the white paper, which Hugh is going to um, outline for us. The questions about Channel 4, um, not just its financial future, but its ownership, you know, this, this um, state-owned body, um, 
which nobody really felt was going to be on the agenda, given that the BBC, uh, the government had such a massive target or a massive sort of issue to deal with, which was the BBC. Um, we realised last September with a leaked picture that uh, the future of Channel 4 was being discussed by government with a particular emphasis on privatisation. The last time um, the Culture Secretary appeared, uh, Whittingdale said that there was still the status quo was still an issue, but that he wants to get something done really soon. Um, he even talked about the period, the really short period um, after the next week's referendum and before the summer recess. But of course, who knows where we'll be then. Um, because we have such a great uh, panel, and I really, really want to leave lots of time for questions because I think, if anything, this EU referendum um, debate on TV, at least, has shown us that the best debates come with lots and lots of public questions. I really want you to um, be able to ask questions at the end. So I'm going to kick off without further ado by asking Hugh to talk about the um, white paper and some of the outlines. I'm then going to talk to, obviously, Alison from the BBC and Ralph at Channel 4. And then Lord Putnam will be able to um, sum up and um, also talk about some of the things that he's been doing on a, the public inquiry, which I've been very pleased to be involved in, and some really interesting um, things that he has to say. So, Hugh, can we hand over to you first? Great. Thank you very much, Jane. And thank you to the University of Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam University, and the Sheffield Doc Fest for extending the invitation to DCMS to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to over the last year in terms of charter review. I will be limiting my remarks to the BBC rather than to Channel 4, not because Channel 4 isn't a very important topic, but we have, the government has yet to announce any policy proposals about how it can enhance the uh, public value of Channel 4. So um, unlike uh, Charter Review, where we have um, made some announcements in the last few weeks. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about what we've been doing, a little bit about uh, the health that the BBC is in at the moment, and then a little bit about the sort of four or five areas where uh, we think reform may be necessary to the BBC to ensure that it maximises public value to you, the licence fee payers, and to those who watch and enjoy BBC services abroad. So, a little bit first, about what have we been doing? Well, we've been... Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, analysing 192,000 uh, responses to our green paper on uh, the uh, future of the BBC. And uh, that was front and centre, as it rightly should be, in light of the, uh, uh, the, the constitutional framework in which the BBC operates. So last, um, uh, it was just before the summer, we got out, the Green Paper set out a, a range of questions around the future of the BBC uh, for, um, to set the basis for its ninth charter. And alongside those consultation responses, we had a lot of input from the Trust, from the BBC, which came up with its own proposals on British Bowl Creative, from Parliament. We commissioned some independent research from experts Oxera and ONO. We commissioned some representative polling from GFK. Um, we had Sir David Clementi doing an independent review of uh, the governance of the BBC. Uh, we had Ofcom uh, doing independent analysis on certain key aspects that required technical analysis. And we had an advisory panel uh, to support the Secretary of State. So, the, the Secretary of State committed to an open and inclusive charter review process. Um, I hope we have delivered that. Certainly from where I sit, I feel we've done everything we could have done in the time we had available to get the range of, of voices that needed to feed into the future of the BBC. And just um, to uh, highlight some of the things that we were looking at, um, it was, you know, why the BBC? What is the, what's the fundamental mission and purpose of the BBC over the next 10 years or so? What should its size and scope be? How should it be governed and how should it be funded? And I should say, because there was a lot of sort of, um, there's quite a lot of noise about this last summer, those are very, very similar questions to what were asked in 2006 uh, and in previous charter reviews. In fact, you almost couldn't imagine a charter review that didn't ask those questions because you'd be doing something fundamentally wrong if, if, if you didn't. So that's a little bit of context. Uh, we've, we've done the white paper. The charter now needs to be written. What's called a framework agreement, for those of you interested, uh, um, a, a long technical document that sits under, underneath the charter still needs to be written. And, and then the BBC will be moving into its ninth charter period um, in uh, 2017. That's a bit of context. Now a little bit about the sort of BBC. And I think one, one way of, uh, or one interesting question with the BBC is, how do, you, how do you view it? Do you feel fundamentally that the BBC is rather a large uh, giant, uh, possibly a friendly giant like Hagrid, or do you see it as more of a minnow in a world 
uh, with an increasing dominance of large US-based, generally, media players. And I only throw that out there partly for, for light amusement, but partly because underneath a lot of debates about the BBC, I think people are making some assumptions about whether they view it more as a minnow or whether they view it as more of Hagrid. Now, I'm not going to come down in favour of one or the other today, but just a few points, I think, um, to reassure those of you who feel that the BBC is somewhat uh, under threat. Its market share in terms of TV uh, is around 30%. Its market share in terms of radio is around 53%. It has around uh, 300 million people who use its services every year. It has the uh, largest production company in the UK. And it has, through its commercial services, one of the largest distribution networks outside of the US main players. Now, of course, size is not itself a measure of anything, but it is, I think, useful context. And for those who worry about the, um, the scale of the BBC. I think some of those numbers should, should give you some comfort. Just wanted to draw attention to, to a couple of those. This, I think, is interesting, the market share of, of, of the BBC. And in particular, these are Ofcom numbers. On the right-hand side, radio. So you'll see about 46% of market share for network radio and about 7% for local radio. You wouldn't find many markets with uh, one player with that sort of dominance. You look at, say, the energy markets, which people think of as quite uh, concentrated, and British gas in, say, electricity has around sort of, you know, 23 24%. So that, that's, a, that's a, a powerful presence. As I say, I make no judgment comment on that, but I think it's important context. Secondly, uh, revenues. These are the revenues of uh, the main uh, public service broadcasters in the EU, and you'll see the BBC is uh, substantially larger than any others, and I think, although we don't quote me on this, it's the second largest, in terms of revenues, public service provider in the world after Japan. Uh, Germany uh, has two or three providers, so the, the, it's slightly more complicated than that picture implies. But again, those worried about the BBC do take comfort in the fact that this is a, a, an organisation of considerable revenues and scale. So, despite what you read about the death of TV, despite all the increase of choice uh, available through DTT platforms and the rest, this is an organisation of, of some scale. But is it a force for good, which in some ways is the interesting question. Fine, it can be, 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 be large, but is it doing useful things? It was very, very clear from uh, uh, almost all the sources that we had in chart review that the answer to that is, in general, and I'll come on to the qualification yet, later, but in general is, yes, it is. We all know because we all consume it. The BBC, at its best, delivers outstanding programming, whether it is in news, whether it's in science, whether it's in current affairs, whether it's in history, whether it's in arts. That's true across online, radio, and television. It, I, I, just to il illustrate one area where I think that is valuable, which is relevant to clearly this month, is in terms of the role it plays in, in helping shape active citizens. Uh, the debates that are going on at the moment are a, a clear demonstration of the, the, the role that the BBC can play uh, in a, a digital age in that space. It also, I think, has a lot of wider benefits. It's often argued that uh, ITV's drama budget is high, partly because it needs to compete with the BBC, and if the BBC wasn't there, it wouldn't need to be uh, quite, so, um, quite so engaged in that particular genre. So alongside its own programming, the BBC does play a, a wider role in the, in the uh, ecology of, of, of media in the UK. And in terms of the responses we got, around 80% of the public said that they think the BBC serves them well or very well. Uh, slightly lower proportions from the representative polling, but, but, but still high. Now, this doesn't mean the BBC is perfect. And there are areas where I think the BBC uh, needs to um, uh, continue to, uh, to strive to deliver. One of the, the representative polls showed that uh, when you rate the BBC between one out of 10, on average, people rated it 6.4. Well, that's good, but is it brilliant? It shows that the, there is space for the BBC to, to, to grow and to develop to provide more value. We all know about the um, £100 million debacle of the Digital Media Initiative, where a lot of money was wasted. There are issues around efficiency of the BBC. And there are specific issues around the extent to which the BBC is serving particular ethnicities uh, and particular um, uh, parts of the country. Just one chart here. I thought this was interesting. We asked, uh, again, this was a representative sample. Um, the BBC offers quite a lot, a lot, or everything I need. White British and Irish giving much more positive response than black viewers. And I think that is, um, uh, that's something that the BBC needs to, needs to focus on. So 
the BBC can't be complacent, but it's working from a, a good base. The question for then the charter review is, right, well, well what, what therefore do we as government need to do about that? Well, the answer is an awful lot should stay the same because people are broadly content. So the license fee, there is not a, a, a strong interest uh, in alternate models of the license fee. Everyone knows the license fee isn't perfect. It's quite regressive, for example. But uh, there is, um, th there's no obvious alternate to the license fee that would provide uh, a better source of stable funding for the BBC. So that stays. The mission to inform, educate, and entertain, that stays. Everyone very clear about that. The purposes of the BBC, which, for those of you interested, sort of underlie the mission, broadly, with a few tweaks, they stay. Because, again, people told us they're broadly happy with them. The split between the BBC doing some things commercially and some things through public service, again, that stays. Um, and finally, the independence of the BBC, which has been a strong theme um, in, in a lot of the media, that stays and is not under threat. So those are the things that stay. What are the things that are going to change? Well, one of the themes of Charter Review was how the BBC does need to try to be even more distinctive than it currently is. Now, there's a debate, and I'm sure we'll get into it, around what we actually mean by distinctiveness. I quite like this quote from uh, David Mitchell from uh, writing a few weeks ago. So what is this distinctiveness that we're all going to be enjoying? What are distinctive things? Well, I'm immediately thinking of the taste of chicken liver, the sound of James Mason's voice, the design tradition of Citroen cars until the late 80s, the smell of Pope's mic, Pope, pipe smoke, <laughs> the style of Raymond Chandler's prose. These are all thoroughly attractive attributes, and I can't wait for BBC TV and radio programmes to sort of somehow start having more of that kind of thing about them. Uh, so, um, but I think he's capturing something quite important there, that this is, uh, this is terminology that isn't uh, necessarily... Um, uh, well, it's contested what, 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 what these words mean. I think uh, uh, one way of looking at this, there is a formal definition in, the, in, in our white paper, but I think this, this captures a bit of the essence of where the government and the Secretary of State are coming from, and I'll read this out as well. Distinctiveness, it means to inform, educate, and entertain, but do so in a way that's original, distinctive, ambitious, groundbreaking, risk-taking, memorable, innovative, informative, stretching, and inspirational. It means challenge, it, programs that challenge, that open our eyes, and brings delight. It means setting the gold standard for every genre of content from news and current affairs to drama, comedy, and yes, quiz programs and everything in between, and doing it across television, radio, and online. What it does not mean is patronizing, derivative, formulaic comedy pro programming that may deliver value to shareholders or advertisers, but that can leave uh, audiences shortchanged. So this isn't, I should say, an attempt to, I'm sorry? Was that the white paper? So, no, this was from a former chair of the BBC, but it is quoted in the white paper. So, th this isn't an attempt to reduce the scale, scale of the BBC. You can have distinctive programmes that are very popular. Indeed, there were some recent documentaries. I think Jeremy Paxman's documentary a couple of weeks ago with three million people uh, uh, watched it. There was a documentary around uh, um, dementia. Again, three million people watched. Uh, millions tune in to uh, David Attenborough explaining the wonders of, the, of the, the, our natural planet, millions tune in to David Cox explaining the wonders of the universe. This is not a debate about distinctive versus popular. It's about ensuring that what we all love and value about the BBC, we get even more of than we are getting at the moment. So I won't dwell on it this too much more, but I just wanted to explain why this is such a theme and just a couple of charts. Again, we asked uh, the British public what do you think about the BBC in terms of whether BBC One and ITV are quite similar apart from the adverts? 43%, 43% of people, representative polling, think that they're quite similar. BBC One gets around 40% of the uh, content budget of the BBC, well over a billion pounds, and 40% of people think that they're getting broadly what they're getting on ITV. Now, no disservice to ITV, anyone who works in, 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 uh, for ITV here, it, it also produces some great programming. But we must ask ourselves, do we really want the BBC to be, to a large proportion of the population, to feel that BBC One is pretty similar to ITV, except for the adverts? Similarly, we've got Radio 1 and Radio 2. I must say, again, Radio 1 and Radio 2 do a lot of distinctive programming, whether it's the Newsbeat program, uh, whether it is some of the Team Hero Awards on, on Radio 1, whether it's some of their live sessions, whether it's breaking new music acts. But very interesting, 31%, almost a third of people, think that Radio 1 is pretty similar to Capital and Absolute, apart from the adverts, and as the same proportion thinking Radio 2 is pretty similar to Magic and Heart. 
I think that's just interesting facts that um, uh, I wanted to, to, to share with you. So what are we going to do about that? Well, ultimately, this is a matter for the BBC and the BBC board uh, to release its uh, cognitive potential, um, uh, and uh, the new unitary board will have an important uh, role in doing that. But um, alongside that, we are updating the mission and the purposes to make sure distinctiveness is at the heart of it. And there are one or two isolated reforms, for example, uh, ring-fencing the World uh, Service budget um, to protect that, as that is one of the most distinctive services that is used by hundreds of millions um, uh, every year. I'll rattle through the others because I'm, I'm using up my, my, um, too much time. But the other areas where um, the white paper suggests reform is needed, um, increased accountability for the BBC. It's a dry subject, so I won't bore you with it, but it's an important one. The uh, trust has, BBC Trust has existed for 10 years. It's widely thought to have been a flawed model. It is going to be reformed. The BBC is going to have its unitary board, which means the governance of the BBC will all be the responsibility of the BBC. And the regulation of the BBC to look at issues like its impact on competition will be done by Ofcom, a powerful regulator with a good track record. And I'm very pleased that, that there seems to be broad consensus that this, which in some ways is the major reform of the, of the white paper, um, has been um, largely accepted as, as the right way forward. Um, thirdly, the BBC needs sufficient funding to deliver against its remit. So uh, the uh, freeze to the license fee has, will be ended and it will be uprated uh, with inflation. Um, some of you will know that's part of a, a wider context in which the BBC will be taking on responsibility for the over 75s TV licenses. I know there are strong views about that. The only thing I would draw attention to is that is part of a wider package where not only are the BBC getting um, the uh, up rate to the uh, inflation rate um, uh, linked uprate to the license fee, but there, um, uh, there will be a, a phasing in of that reform and there will be a removal of other uh, what are called ring fences. So overall, the BBC will be what's called in Whitehall terminology flat cash, which means it basically gets the same amount of cash over the next five years, which in the context of what a lot of other media organizations and a lot of public sector organizations are facing is, I think, a firm but fair deal for the BBC. So, fourthly, um, the market impact of the BBC. Uh, we just need to make sure that as a, uh, a large player in the media market, it's sort of straining every sinew to uh, um, minimize any undue, and I stress undue, negative market impact um, on other players um, and to maximize its, its, uh, its partnership working. Some of you will have seen the, um, the work that the BBC did with the RSC uh, on, on, um, uh, in the last few weeks on Shakespeare's anniversary. That's the kind of partnership working that shows the BBC at its best, and the government is keen to see more of it. Uh, also, archive. As some of you will know, the BBC has a very big archive, um, and uh, the hope is it will be able to digit make more of that digital so more people can make use of it um, and uh, for, for the benefit of a wider range of, of programmers. Uh, then finally, the uh, efficiency and transparency of the BBC is the fifth area. The BBC, to, to be fair, has done quite a lot to enhance its efficiency over the last few years. And, and the challenge is, can it do even more in the context of a public that is broadly sceptical about, still about the efficiency of the BBC? Around a quarter of people think that the BBC um, is, is, is efficient, with the majority of the others thinking that it, that it isn't. Uh, and in terms of transparency, although the BBC is transparent about a lot of things, and those of you who read the Daily Mail will uh, constantly be being told how much is being spent on uh, uh, taxis by uh, various BBC executives, um, there are other things the BBC is less transparent about. For example, you don't know what the BBC is spending on drama versus what it's spending on news. It's your BBC, it's your license fee pay of money, uh, and the government feels you have a right to know. Um, therefore, alongside um, a, bit, a bit more transparency and pay, there will be more transparency uh, on uh, genre spend. Um, and on efficiency, there are a number of proposals. Probably the most important is a further opening up of BBC production to competition so that BBC commissioners aren't bound to use in-house BBC production. They will, in future, more than in the past, be able to use uh, uh, the full range of the fantastic independent production companies that exist in the UK and outside of news and uh, news-related current affairs, by the end of the charter, there'll be 100 percent of that opened up to, to, to commissioning. Um, so I, I hope that gives a flavor. I've tried to, not to completely overwhelm you, but to give you enough of a sense of uh, what, what, what is in the Charter Review and what people have been debating about over the last year. Um, I must say I've been pleased with the reception. The BBC has welcomed it. 
the people who were worried that the government was going to do something uh, in their view, eyes very foolish with the BBC, I think, have broadly um, been proved wrong. Uh, there is still work to do. There are important details that will need to be um, uh, um, uh, worked through in terms of the Charter and the Framework Agreement. But I hope and expect that we will be in a place where we'll, we will all be able to enjoy a stronger BBC uh, over the next 10 years. Thanks very much, Hugh. You've given us a huge amount to discuss there. Um, and I hope we've got lots of time to come back on, particularly on issues of independence, in, impartiality. Um, but I do want to focus, as you, uh, as you suggested, on this word of distinctiveness, talking to Alison. I mean, it, it was in that white paper, it was mentioned 50 times, distinct, distinctiveness. And that very helpful list of adjectives with words like groundbreaking, it's very difficult to know, you know, Alison, you're in charge of a huge budget and a team of people at the BBC. We sort of get the impression the government likes Shakespeare, David Attenborough and dementia, doesn't really like Homes Under the Hammer. Tell me, how is it going to affect your job and what do you see as distinctive programming that the licence fee payer, who after all are the people that pay for the BBC, actually want? I will talk about distinctiveness. There was quite a lot in that. Do you, mind if I, do you mind if I just have the opportunity to come back on some of it? And, yeah. and please bear with me because I didn't see it in advance. So I, I always wondered how the opposition responded so quickly after a budget. And I'm, I will, uh, you know, I'll do my best to pick up on some of the points. I do feel like I've just had my school report read out in a very public forum. <laughs> sort of 6.4 out of 10 must do better. Um, what I would say is um, the consultation for the white paper, you know, 80% approval ratings. I can think of of lots of uh, organisations that would be very happy with 80% approval ratings. Um, just to pick up on some of the points, you talked about the size of the BBC and you compared it to British Gas. I, to me, that doesn't feel like a valid comparison because British Gas is motivated by making money and we at the BBC are motivated by creative excellence and not profit. So I just think we should be careful about the types of comparisons we make. Um, um, you talked about diversity. I'm in complete agreement. Uh, I think there was a panel about it today. Uh, I I've said before, I don't think there's ever been a time when the public service broadcasters, Channel 4 and the BBC, are so committed to making meaningful change um, on the issue of diversity, both in terms of on-screen portrayal, off-screen, uh, the content that we um, are delivering to audiences. It's such an important issue, and I agree we need to do more. Um, we need to do more seasons. We need to do more within the, the heart of the schedule as a matter of course, so absolutely. Um, distinctiveness, clearly we're going to talk about that quite a lot today. Um, you used an interesting phrase. Y you said, what we all love and value about the BBC. What I would say on this is, what we, there is not one single thing that we all love and value about the BBC. You know, while we are funded by the British public at large, we need to offer something of value to everyone, and it won't be the same thing for everyone. And I think the Secretary of State himself said that when you start talking about distinctiveness at a programme level, for example, with Homes Under the Hammer or Bargain Hunt, it becomes so subjective. It's such a matter of personal judgment. And I don't think we want to get into a world where we are prescriptively deciding what people should value. I think we should listen to what they do value. Um, I think the, the description of distinctiveness in the white paper is really useful, actually, and there's still a misunderstanding. There are producers who come in and ask me how it's going to affect us that we have to be more distinctive, and there's a sense that being distinctive means having to commission in areas of market failure. And actually, I think your description in the white paper is useful and really chimes with what we, we do. I'm sure Channel 4 do every, you know, as, a, as a daily matter, of course. You talk about risk-taking, absolutely. You talk about pro making programmes of the highest quality. Um, you talk about uh, original UK programming. You talk about a range of programming. And crucially, you also, as part of the description of distinctiveness talk about um, the range of audiences we serve. And again, that speaks to the point of diversity, but equally it speaks to us being very careful about deciding what we should value. Um, ITV versus BBC. I mean, I suppose, you know, is ITV like BBC? Yes. Um, is ITV like BBC One? Yes, it's more like BBC One than Marks and Spencers is. I, I think it depends how you frame the question. Uh, all I would say is that, you know, th th there's double the amount of factual programming in BBC One peak time than there is in ITV peak time, and there's half as much entertainment in BBC One peak time than there is in ITV peak time. And actually, if you look at BBC One as an example, 50% of the output is news, current affairs, and fact. So I think BBC One's really distinctive. Uh, I disagree with the description of it not being distinctive. Can it be more distinctive? Should that be an ambitious um, ambition for all of us? 
all of us, you, the programme makers, pitching us programmes, us as commissioners informing the de decisions we make, absolutely, we should, we should continue to strive to be as distinctive as we can, whilst remembering that there's not a singular view of that. Um, and then the unitary board and governance, I mean, think, I think that's really interesting, and uh, that feels like a particular issue that perhaps we'll come on to later um, in, in the session, and I think people should feel really uh, comfortable about throwing questions into the mix. Yeah, as I say, there's, there was a lot to go on, just, not just about, um, uh, you know, the, the whole BBC and the sort of ecosystem of... Um, of uh, public service broadcasting. I do want to bring in uh, Ralph at Channel 4 because obviously where we might be talking about the sort of funding and what sort of programmes for Channel 4, its very existence as a publicly owned institution has been called into question. Yes. Um, so not just are you sort of facing this, uh, the future with huge competition from American broadcasters, from Netflix, from Amazon. Um, what difference will it make? The, you know, the DCMS paper which said we're looking at all options including privatisation. John Whittingdale has said actually investment in Channel 4 could really help it you know, yes. pi from private companies from wherever they, where they come from. What difference will that make I'm to Channel 4? I'm dying to answer 4? that question. <laughs> before I, and I will, but before I do, I just have to back reference a couple of things from that, that presentation because I found it extraordinary. Um, you should so, have that, pro so that I'll say, presentation I'll say two before. things about the BBC. <laughs> There was, one, there was one slide there that listed the, showed the revenue of the BBC to be considerably higher than the revenue of other big public service broadcasters in other countries. But I only saw one organisation on that list that is world respected and is looked up to as a kind of you know, quality benchmark by countries around the world. And it's not Rye, and it's not Sudwest Winston, you know. So let's not put the BBC on the same pedestal as all of those other broadcasters. It's in a league of its own, and it's respected around the world. It's not just the public service broadcasters that say that. It's the commercial Americans at Edinburgh last year. You had the kind of leaders, the kind of decision makers from American broadcasting coming over. They're saying, we're looking across at what you're doing in the UK. We're looking at what actors you're backing, what writers you're backing. We're looking at you for creative inspiration. The BBC plays a massive part in that. The second thing that I think we've got, got to reflect on is that brilliant quote about distinctiveness. Now... As far as I can see, what that does is it claims all the brilliant adjectives for the BBC and it leaves the rest of us with those rubbishy adjectives at the bottom. <laughs> does that mean that we're going to be, we've got to join Channel 5 in the kind of derivative, kind of follow the crowd step? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be on that step. Sorry, Channel 5, I shouldn't have. It was an easy, was an easy, <laughs> shot, an easy shot. But seriously, how, those, all those adjectives at the top, I want to be part of those adjectives too. I want to be, you know, Channel 4, we're ambitious, we're groundbreaking, we're innovative, we're diverse, we're different. Um, uh, it's not just the BBC that has those things. So I don't see how you can define the BBC as a very long list of positive attributes that any commissioning editor, any creative person, even Channel 5, uh, you know, they go into work trying to do good work. Sorry, I really shouldn't talk about Channel 5. <laughs> no, they go into work trying to do good work. They don't go in there trying to make derivative TV. So, you know, I, I don't think the BBC should be somehow put in a different category of distinctive. I don't, I don't understand distinctive, to be honest. I find it really tricky and problematic. When it comes to privatisation, I think... No one has advanced any uh, argument uh, this year or, or previously about how privatisation might benefit Channel 4. You know? So this idea that, that, that privatisation would give Channel 4 more backing, more strength, more, more, more finance, well, it doesn't seem to be shared by the potential people that might buy Channel 4. So, you know, David Zaslav, who, uh, as, as the leader of Discovery, was said to be one of the people that might be interested in running the rule over Channel 4 and potentially acquiring it. I think he'd love to buy Channel 4. But he said the other day... He couldn't see how, how he could make a, a purchase of Channel 4 make sense with its current commitments. Now, Channel 4's current commitments, known to those of us who work there as our remit or our brand or our identity, are actually what make all of us at Channel 4 get out of bed in the morning. They're what make us come to work. And they're what motivate and, I think, drive a massive number of creative people in this industry. Those are the things that a buyer of Channel 4 would see as a potential obstacle. So it's clear from what's been said this year that there is some doubt about the, 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 how our remit is expressed. You know, the Secretary of State said that he thought it was fuzzy. So I thought as a kind of very quick exercise in is it fuzzy or do we think it's clear, we might just look at the DocFest programme, since we're here in Sheffield, doing DocFest, and sort of look at some of the things, just a few of them, uh, that Channel 4 has contributed to the programme here and see whether we think there's... Have we got a clear remit? Are we contributing something that's different, that's, uh, the, the, that's an expression of that remit? Distinctive. Distinctive, yeah. possibly. Mm. So let's just run through a few of them. So forgive me, it's a little, little list. So on Saturday at 10 o'clock, uh, uh, Arts Commissioning for Online, 
Pega Faramand, our commissioning editor for Random Acts. Random Acts is just one tiny little corner of what, you know, we see ourselves as a greenhouse of innovation in the UK. Random Acts is an art strand, collaboration with the Arts Council that makes hundreds of new films, short films, uh, by creatives, creative types and by artists around the country. Up and down the country, they're working on these films to go on Channel 4 Online and on Channel 4 Television. Uh, on Sunday at 12.15, disability on and off screen. Addie Rawcliffe, our disability manager, would have been talking about uh, the progress that we're making on disability. Uh, this year, we've got the second Paralympics on Channel 4, and we've made massive commitments, both on and off screen, to disabled talent, working on those shows and developing their careers in the industry and working on screen. That sits at the centre of a thing we're calling the Year of Disability. Uh, and we've made additional commitments so that we're going to double the number of disabled people appearing in 20 of our biggest shows on Channel 4, and we're going to uh, use 20 other shows to advance the careers of disabled people behind, behind, the, behind the camera. So, you know, the Year of Disability is just one part of our 360 charter, uh, including the commissioning guidelines. The work that's going on on diversity uh, at Channel 4 is a huge, huge sort of multi-layered thing, and it's the kind of thing that uh, David Zaslav describes as one of our current commitments. We really believe in it. And so, yet, I mean, I know that there are lots of amazing programmes that are in this festival, but, I mean, Wishing Dale himself said that there are lots and lots of people knocking on his door saying, we would love to buy Channel 4. Yes, and do you and think, they, also do you think it would remain the same? Well, so he says, I'm obviously not him, um, and I think Hugh has given a suggestion of what they think about BBC's distinctiveness, but I think what the government have said is even, even with its remit, these people, these buyers would all be really interested. Are you saying that those sorts of programmes cannot be made if you had a foreign owner, for example? Discovery, maybe not. Yeah. Um, although potential buyers often don't uh, tell the truth. But do you think you cannot do those programmes if you were not if you were owned by somebody else, if I you had a Channel time, 5 over ownership. How, is, is it possible to imagine a privatised Channel 4 staying the same? You know, could we deliver the remit to the same degree that we do now if we were privatised and we had to deliver a profit? No one has advanced any suggestion of how that might be possible, how there might be some other value conjured up out of the air that would suddenly make us worth value. So the only place that you could make, you, yes, you could make some efficiencies on Channel 4, you could sack a few people, you could move the building, you could uh, sell the building, but really the only place that you can extract value from Channel 4 as it stands today is from the programming budget. So, you know, that programming budget is not just spent on documentaries. You know, Nick Mursky's here, if anyone was here at the panel yesterday, I give Nick Mursky £45 million this year to spend on documentaries. Uh, that's up on last year, it's £8 million up on two years ago. Uh, is that going to continue? Is that funding of documentaries and the different, you know, right across the board of different types of documentaries from big mainstream ones to small singles to first cut, anyone at the first cut pitch yesterday? Are we still going to back 10 new directors every year to make hour-long documentaries on Channel 4 when someone has to extract profit from Channel 4? So, you know, this is the beginning of the list, the specialist factual panel, Muslims on TV, all the work that we're doing, you know, making difficult documentaries, things like we are in Birmingham at the moment, making uh, uh, a three-part documentary series at Birmingham Central Mosque. It takes two years to make a documentary series like that. It is absolutely not the kind of thing that a commercially funded broadcaster is going gonna, is gonna to drive out. You don't see documentaries like that on ITV. You know, you see good documentaries on ITV, but they play much more safe. They don't take the kind of risk and devote themselves to the kind of really difficult to make stuff that we do. Mm -hmm. There's a documentary series that we've been trying to make for about two years uh, called The Troubled Families Unit, uh, which you're never going to see on Channel 4 because we had to write it off the other day because the access fell through. Well, that's, that's, that's a, not a day-to-day -day occurrence, but it's the kind of product of... Channel 4 constantly reaching for subjects that are difficult to achieve and difficult to realise. And we back the creative sector through trying to make those things and we pick them up when they fall down and we send them back out to make another thing. So the idea that all of this, you know, the different layers of it, the first cut, you know, first cut, the programmes about the refugee crisis, look at our current affairs, look at Escape from ISIS. If you're going to watch one programme on Channel 4 in the last 12 months, 12 months, watch Escape from ISIS, is that really going to be made by mm. a, 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 a commercial Channel 4 that has to deliver profits? No, I can't imagine that. Brilliantly segued into um, the last speaker on this brilliant panel, um, David Putnam. What Ralph says about ITV, about commercial, very rude about um, Channel 5, but is it fair? You know, public service commitments. Um, today, the inquiry has uh, put out a statement about ITV saying it is a public service to, uh, broadcaster. It should live up to that by producing more regional programming, for example. Talk, I know that you've been looking at 
at the whole ecosystem and the future of public service television in this country. Um, talk to us about some of the findings that you've made. Thanks, Jane. I think the most important finding <coughs> that's emerged from nine months now looking at this subject is the role that public service broadcasting has inextricably with democracy. If, if the audience here feel that democracy is something so extraordinarily virile and stable that it doesn't really need talking about or defending or worrying about, then much of what I'm about to say is, is, is nonsense. You're going to pop out for a, a pee. But if you actually think, as I do, that we're at a, a very, very difficult, dangerous uh, crossroads, uh, then public service broadcasting has never been more important, I don't think, at any point since the day it was created. I really sincerely believe that. I'll kill off one thing quickly. This issue of market failure, because I'm sure that Hugh and his colleagues have been subjected to all sorts of lobbying and arguments about uh, the way in which public service broadcasting, as presently constituted, uh, is, is a kind of facet of market failure. Some key numbers here, and jot them down. Sky, 19, this is 2015. Sky, 9 billion in revenues, 1.7 billion in profits. There's very few companies in the entire FTSE 100 that make anything like that percentage on, the, on, on turnover. ITV, 2.8 billion in revenues, 800 million in profit, including a 4, billion, a 4 million, sorry, bonus for its CEO. These are not troubled businesses. <laughs> These are not businesses that are struggling in the margins. <laughs> These are really, really not businesses that ought to be going to a Conservative government for support and help. Um, Channel 4, interestingly, uh, just ch ch checked today. Both revenues and UK commissioning spend are at their highest level ever. I speak as, as I was a very happy deputy chairman for six years. Highest level ever. Uh, commissioning from Indies uh, is the same as ITV, is greater than ITV and Channel 5 combined. And here's an interesting one. This business about Channel 4 possibly being fragile. Channel 4 has got 250 million pounds in reserves. At one point when I was on board, it was 300 million. And we all decided as a board it was an inappropriately large amount. And we actually spent down, quite deliberately at one point, spent down to, I think, 220 million. Most PLCs in Britain carry debt. Channel 4 carries a 250 million pound reserve. This is not an ailing, troubled, or endangered organization. So those, there's just some numbers, and I'm certainly not an economist. What I really want to talk about is trust and ignorance, and the role that broadcasting in general and public service broadcasting in particular play in that equation. I want, if I may, I want to show two clips, quite short. Uh, the first one from your, you recognise immediately, immediately from Good Night and Good Luck. This is David Strathern, re, it's a reconstituted uh, version of a speech that was given by Ed Murrow, the American journalist, 58 years ago. Just listen to what he has to say, it's quite short. I'd like to point out, and I'm interested in what Hugh has to say on this, he happened 58 years ago to touch on just two possible subjects. Would the American public have been illuminated by a discussion on a Sunday night on the state of American education? And the other subject he chooses, would the American public have benefited from an assessment of American policy in the Middle East? Well, I would argue that the resounding answer to both those is hugely, hugely. Try to imagine if the United States had focused 58 years ago on what its policy towards the Middle East might be and what the repercussions would be if it failed to have a policy, which is where we are. So this is a conversation I, I, I want to have about, about trust and ignorance. What I've just taken out of the referendum, and many of you will agree, disagree with me, is that we've got a politics at the moment that's running on the basis of basically ignorance, fear, and prejudice. Far from actually being informed democracy, informed plural democracy, we're actually running on fear. We're running on fear because we're ignorant, and we're ignorant because we don't use the means to inform ourselves adequately of the issues that most affect our lives. This is very serious stuff. I'll show you one other clip, which is possibly where we're going to and what, poss and what possibly the future offers. So again, a short clip from the programme Newsroom. Okay, so I'm concerned for the rest of us because what we've d done in the last 20, 30, 40 years is constantly defaulted to market assumptions. Somehow or other, the market's got answers 
that we as citizens and civilians don't have. It's just not true. And the one area, the one block we've managed to create for ourselves is what we term public service broadcasting. If we allow that to start getting undermined by misassumptions about market failure or misassumptions about what the, the importance of, of accurate information is, we will go the way of the United States and we will end up having a, 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 a Trump-like future. I believe that absolutely sincerely. I'm saying this as a very old man who has lived a great number of lives and watched this take place. Public service broadcasting is what stands between us and a chasm. And if we are stupid enough to allow it in any way to be undermined, far from not, not just being undermined, not to be enhanced, encouraged, and in, this, in a sense directed towards ensuring that we are a highly informed, highly intelligent, fear-free society, then we will pay the price. Thanks very much. Um, while the lights go up, I feel that we, we could have had two sessions here, actually, with these, this vision of public service broadcasting and what it can do, you know, with comparisons of the money made to a utility, to British gas, to merely lights and wires in a box, um, to this vision of what we could become and what um, great public service TV can do. Um, I really, what we've got three mics in the audience. Please, please put up your hands. While, have you got someone there, did you say? Um, while you're all thinking and putting your hands up, I'll ask one question to you at the beginning. You just, you did sort of slightly sweep over. There was a line where you said, um, independence, that stays, mm -hmm. when you talked about the BBC. Now, of the two remaining issues, I know the BBC um, were very unhappy about uh, the sort of parts of the settlement, two remaining parts once the white paper had come out, one of which was pay, mm. uh, which I think that could be another whole session. Um, but the other thing was independence and the fact that if, you, if the government are appointing the chair, the deputy chair, and four regional um, directors, they could have, if not control, they'll have 50%. How does that still, how do you still say independence, it's done? Okay, so the, there are a number of proposals in the white paper that relate to independence and some of those I think actually enhance the independence of the BBC and the one that's received most coverage but I think fairly is the 11-year charter. Now there were a number of people who thought that the world was speeding up and because it's speeding up we therefore need to have a shorter charter uh, to make sure that we take account of technological developments that we haven't anticipated. And don't forget, in 2006, which was when the last charter was set, no one had a smartphone. This has all happened incredibly quickly. Who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years? And the government decided to uh, uh, provide an 11-year charter to the BBC, which the BBC very much welcomed as a bolster to its independence. On the particular issue of the appointments to the board, uh, the proposal is, as you suggest, that um, uh, there will be a board of between 12 and 14, um, six of those will be through a public appointments process. Uh, the BBC is an organisation with about £3.7 billion worth of licence fee pair money, so it's entirely appropriate that uh, there is a public appointments process for a proportion of the BBC board. Uh, the BBC Trust, which as I said, has um, been governing and regulating to some extent the BBC over the last 10 years, 100% of its members are uh, appointed through a public appointments process. And the previous BBC governors were uh, appointed through a, uh, um, a public appointments process. So I think there's been too much made of this. Um, I don't see this as a threat to the independence of the BBC. I see it as a, 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 a fair proposal um, that balances the uh, needs of the BBC who will have 50% uh, or more appointments controlled through their own nominations committee and a public appointments process uh, in light of the fact that there is so much public money that is going into the BBC. Okay. Um, can I, 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 I suppose all I would say is, uh, you know, we're going to have an external regulator which we welcome in Ofcom, that Ofcom can bring sanctions against us. And 
it feels like it's something that's so acutely felt by the British public that the BBC remains as an independent broadcaster and doesn't slowly seep into becoming a state broadcaster. So just to sort of put the other side, it's been described as an honourable disagreement. I think the BBC view is absolutely there should be a public appointments process for the chair and the vice chair. And then like any other PLC, the BBC nominations committee would decide on the makeup of the rest of the board and that would then be complemented by Ofcom um, an external regulator. So, you know, there is, a, there is still a disagreement and, and I, you, I think we need to... I, I don't think as an audience, as the owners of the BBC, you should necessarily uh, be assured that independence is protected at the moment. It, this still has to play out a little, I don't... David, you've got some... Yes, we've given a lot of thought to this uh, on, during the inquiry and rather than come up with any conclusions ourselves, because it is a very ex expert area, and because the environment in which we're all operating in, and, and, and Hugh is forced to operate in, is one of essentially mistrust, not, not trust, we went to the, the just-retired uh, Commissioner for Public uh, Office, uh, Sir David Normington, and asked him to advise us. And as an appendix to our report, there would be is a, is a small, short report from Sir David setting out exactly what he believes the government in this quite difficult situation ought to be doing. And of course, it applies equally to the BBC as well. That the, it isn't a question of just being independent, it's being seen to be independent and, being, and verifying that level of independence. So we're suggesting this is taken as far away from the government as possible, and indeed the BBC may be discomforted by some of these suggestions, but we don't believe in the present political and social environment that uh, any form of interference uh, is appropriate, and that it, and from a huge point of view, it is very difficult. Any form of perceptible interference will be misinterpreted. So, in fact, we believe we're acting on behalf of the government in putting forward the recommendations of the, of the commissioner, which I think are, are very sound. He points, in, incidentally, very interesting, he points us to the Nolan principles of public life, which all political parties sign up to, and which I think certainly ought to be the kind of gold standard against which, against which all of these decisions are made. Okay. Um, forgive me if it, it's a beautiful venue, this, but it's really hard to see people with their hand up. But there are, th there are three people. First, the gentleman here, then here, then the man there, and then we'll come back to that man at the fourth. Do please put your hands up. If there are any women, there's always men who ask first. But um, go on. <laughs> I'm representing, sorry, my name's Krishna Aurora. I'm representing uh, an Australian uh, public broadcaster called SBS. Um, uh, and I used to work at the BBC. Um, I wanted to pick up just very briefly on what um, uh, both um, Sir David uh, and Ralph said about the view of the BBC um, outside um, the UK. And I did wonder whether the consultation document, forgive me if it did say this, did it ever ask the question, um, how is the BBC perceived and how should the BBC be perceived outside the UK? I know it talked about the scope of its yeah. um, uh, contribution to the British creative community, but did it talk about what the BBC, as a representative of what is often called soft power, what the value of that is? I know our audience on SBS really loves and values the programmes um, it gets, which are commissioned by the BBC and Channel 4, I have to say, in equal measure. Um, if that was diminished, our audience would really feel it. Um, notwithstanding all the great programmes that are made by Australian companies. Um, uh, I, I think, as, as Ralph said, there are many um, broadcasters looking at us as if we're completely mad. I mean, I mean, looking at the BBC or looking at Britain, as if we're completely mad to risk uh, damaging or minimising or restricting the creativity um, of the organisation. So Thank it's you. a question, um, how much consideration was, was sort yes. of put to the view from abroad, as it were? Yeah. I mean, Hugh, I think you'll... So uh, a couple of things to say about that. There was quite a lot in the Green Paper around the soft power value of the BBC, um, precisely uh, as, as you articulated it. Um, and as I said earlier, there was um, a decision, which is not a small decision, particularly in the context we're just talking about the independence of the BBC, to choose to ring fence a bit of the licence fee money that's going to the BBC for the World Service is not something that, um, you know, those who see as the independence as uh, the, the only objective would necessarily have welcomed. So that, that was a signal given by the government to the important role um, and I think also to the, an awareness that the 
the voices of those abroad are harder to bring into the decision-making processes than some of the uh, license fee pair constituencies within the UK. Um, there was also in the uh, white paper a, a brief reference to global news, which I think is important because it's probably one of the few areas where uh, people abroad feel the, the BBC is not delivering as well as it could do. It's very much the radio service um, uh, through World Service that is held in high regard. The, the, the global news is, is less highly regarded. So we didn't make much of that, but there was a suggestion in the, in the, the white paper that to maximise the uh, soft power of, of, of the BBC, it does need to make sure that all its services uh, that are being uh, delivered globally uh, are, are, are valued. And I must say, this is something I, I personally feel. I've lived for two years in the US. I'm sure a number of, of, of you have spent time there. Uh, you know, um, it's very, very clear when you spend time outside of, of the UK just what the value is of a public service broadcaster that is properly funded and is properly uh, regulated. Gentleman there. Um, I'm Mark Galloway from the International Broadcasting Trust. Actually, my question follows on from that. Um, at the moment, one of the purposes of the BBC is to bring the UK to the world and the world to the UK. And you've redrawn the purposes, I think, to simplify them. And what you've actually done is you've beefed up that purpose, and that is now a purpose in its own right but you have diluted the bringing the, U the world to the UK. At the moment, bringing to the world to the UK covers all genres. News, current affairs, factual, children's, drama, and entertainment. In the new purpose, it covers news and current affairs only. Uh, and you are actually diluting something that the BBC does that's very important. If our view of the world is only through news and current affairs. It presents a very distinct picture, but it focuses on conflict, war, disaster, and so on. We need non-news and current affairs content to put that in a wider context. So why are you diluting that very important purpose? Again, Again I think that's... There is, that's a, a simple answer to that. There is no intention to dilute that purpose. Um, we can all think of things that the BBC is doing beyond news and current affairs. Um, Scandi dramas, for example. Why have you done it so if there's the, no intention? The, is it a mistake? Will you correct the mistake? Um, the, the, there is nothing in the current purposes that is stopping uh, delivering of what you want. So there's no need to make any changes. The, there, are, there are, as you know, well, there are five purposes. What's the point of the purposes if they don't say explicitly what you intend them to say? They do say explicitly on the news because the news is the one that is, uh, has most prominence and most focus. Uh, and the others can be captured within the other purposes. I, I, I really so are, are, you, are, you saying, are you saying that there is no... There is, there is, there is That's no, not there, the intention. There is no intention and there is no expectation that anything will change well, there. Well, are you willing Do to you want clarify to? that? I, I just have clarified just, it. And you yeah. should be reassured that as commissioners, we will continue to bring the world to you in factual commissioning. So, for example, coming up... Well, I know uh, you will, but it's helpful to have it black and, in black and white as mm. a purpose. But no intent. So if there's I, no intent... I suppose just to, before we... Finish this point. If there's absolutely what you're saying is there's absolutely no intention of a diminution of bringing the world. Absolutely. Why? No, none, none at all. And it, if it's not been written anywhere, where is it sort of absolutely? Well, it's not. It's not excluded. So there's there's no reason for it. <laughs> I think the audience okay. response says it all, Hugh. Well. Okay. Next question, please. Thank you. Hi there. I'm. I wonder if um, the other panelists, aside from you, particularly Lord Putnam could clarify for, for an ignoramus what precisely the areas of jeopardy uh, are um, with respect to um, conservative government policy towards public broadcasting. It seemed to me that Hugh's presentation um, of, of, of the recent you know, consultation and so on over charter renewal um, seemed to address, and John Whittingdale, who's more civilised than the rest of them, seems to have addressed a lot of uh, the, the very substantial, profound concerns we had about what the government might do with the BBC. Um, and the data that he's shown about audience um, concerns about the BBC seem to be something that a government department ought to be responding to in, in, in charge of renewal. I wonder, yeah, could you give us a sense, aside from, um, aside from independence, which you talked about, um, um, what, what are the areas of, of, of jeopardy 
uh, towards uh, our public service broadcasters at the moment. David. I think, I, I hope this is an answer, it, because quite a, it could be a, de a debate, and I don't want to enter into that. I think what uh, principally concerns me is the following. <clears throat> The difference between stupid and smart people is that stupid people continue to make the same mistake, and smart people only make the same make the one mistake once and learn from it. Um, I'm hoping, I've no, no idea what, what the result will be. I'm hoping that on the 27th of, um, oh, sorry, on the 23rd of this month, when the Brexit result comes through, if it goes, uh, as it were, if the exit of people win. Um, Will we reflect on the fact that maybe this is the result of the fact that the broadcasting and indeed newspapers in Britain have managed successively to ill-inform or misinform the population of this country over what its role within Europe is? I've watched this debate. I've been operating particularly in, in I live in Ireland, operating particularly trying to get the Irish, um, the, the registered Irish votes uh, out. I am staggered by the level of ignorance. Forget if you're in or out, it doesn't matter. The sheer level of ignorance is utterly staggering. So we are moving into a, making the most important decision, maybe the most important decision in my lifetime, out of ignorance, not out of knowledge. And surely I would have imagined that one of the purposes, and the, and the broadcasters, Alison, we all have to ask ourselves a big question. How do we let this happen? How do we actually manage to reach a point where we haven't got a clue as to what Europe really represents in our lives, what it's come from, and I'm a child born in the war, I have a vivid memory of the war, what it's come from and where it's headed. Have we not made the most, are we not in danger of making the most important decision of all of our lives in ignorance? And is that not partly a responsibility of broadcasters? So I think my answer to the question is, we've got to wake up and, learn and realize that we haven't done a good enough job. And I think what I'm trying to, if I'm railing against, or I'm trying to go argue, is that We've reached this point. We now need to make, and maybe I'm arguing very much in a sense for you, maybe BBC isn't good enough yet. Maybe we do need a more, in a sense, of greater imposition on, on ITB. I know ITB is a, 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 a private company, but in the end we do have levers. Maybe we don't use the levers we've got enough. We cannot go into the 20, rest of the 21st century as an ignorant, prejudiced, stupid people. In a... Yeah, I mean, uh, to answer for Channel 4, what greater jeopardy could there be than turning Channel 4 from a not-for-profit organisation into a profit-making organisation? That's going to have a profound effect on all of the creative sector, that, you know, where we make all of our programmes are made by independent producers, many of them here. Uh, and it's going to have a profound effect on what audiences get and what deal they get from us. And it's going to be at a time when Channel 4 is trying to face the future and move into a digital age and address new audiences in different ways, change our programming model so that we've got much more kind of, you know, appeal online, change our advertising model so that we can make a a a a revenue online. And that's already, you know, we're doing extremely well. As David says, we're in very robust health. We made a surplus last year. Channel 4's, you know, ch uh, channel share has been up for 14 out of the last 16 months. We're in a really good place to face that future, but it's going to be a really challenging future, you know. And so to do that at the same time that we're suddenly turned into a, you know, privatised organisation that has to deliver someone a profit, because ultimately they all do, um, uh, is, is going to have a profound... That, that, the, the jeopardy of that, I'd say, is profound. And just to add that, I th I th I'm sort of... Uh, it's it's a solution, but I'm not clear what the problem is yet in terms of Channel 4. So I, I, it has been touched upon earlier. Our broadcast ecology is the envy of the world. It really is. And I mean that the BBC alongside Channel 4, alongside the commercial broadcasters. I, I, I haven't heard the case yet as to why change should come. Um, right. Now, we've got uh, far more hands up. There's a gentleman here. Um, and then can we have that lady there? There's also, I don't know where the mics have gone, actually. Can, I can only see this there, mic. No. Uh, there's, a, there's a lady right at the back there. Sorry. Can, oh. There's a question. Oh, OK. There, there is actually a lady there waiting, has been waiting patiently. Um, right, can we, let's take these first. Um, we might have to ask a couple and then uh, get the panel to ask us, um, just in case that light starts flashing at me. But, uh, <coughs> sorry. I'm Jay Blumler, University of Leeds, and I'd like to direct my remarks to Mr. Harris. I've read the white paper from page one to page whatever it was at the end, and I've admired much of the analysis and argument and documentation 
on those points that you reassured us about. But I've also looked closely at, chapter, at the chapter entitled Enshrining Independence and Accountability. That properly raises the question and the issue of how to relate these two important norms in the case of the BBC in the future. But I think its recipe, its answer to that crucial issue is flawed for three, in three main respects. First of all, and most importantly, it fails to grasp the nettle explicitly by addressing the worry that so many state-led appointments to the new board will compromise the BBC's ability to be uh, independent in its production of news and even in its uh, world service um, activity. It's, we, it's we a matter of trust in this organization uh, that those appointments might be interpreted and perceived as um, an injection of a state influence on this precious broadcaster. You haven't, in the white paper, addressed that concern. You've said a lot of things about how independence would be uh, safeguarded, but you haven't said, ah, well, what about this worry and how you answer that. Secondly, and very briefly, um, in looking at the balance between accountability and independence, it's arguable that you've gone an awful long way on the accountability side because the BBC is going to be accountable to the board, of course, to Ofcom in many more ways, and to the National Audit Office. So many <laughs> avenues of accountability, are they really reconcilable with a set of broadcasters who's going to tr have to try to be distinctive and not be too cautious? and be risk-taking, that's at least a problematic matter. Mm. And lastly, I think if this prospectus for the future of the BBC is adopted as it stands, and I know things are still open to negotiation, instead of a public service model of the BBC, we'll sort of have a hybrid model. Part state broadcaster, part public service broadcaster, part even commercial broadcaster. Now maybe that's a natural response to the complicated environment in which the public, a public broadcaster is now uh, embroiled. But um, can all those ingredients be reconciled with the kind of distinctive purpose that you and the white paper outlines so, so what's the, eloquently? What's that final question though? Can the a, hybrid a, model? A, a strong Director General might be able to manage it, and Tony what? Hall is one. But so is the, is the question, is the hybrid model, does that work? As well as, if you can address, you um, these concerns that were mentioned. Um, while the mic goes over to this, uh, the lady there, could you also please, there's a man who's been waving his hands for a while, I couldn't see where the mic was, um, there, who's holding something. Could you all please, the next questions, can you um, actually ask the direct questions, please? Only because, you know, there's lots of you that want to say something. Um, and I'd like to get around to you all. Hugh. Yeah, well, look, I'll be brief. I, um, I appreciate the question. I don't have much more to say on the um, uh, appointments process other than, than, than what I said before. I think we have to be very careful with language here. The idea that the BBC is going to be turned into a state broadcaster is frankly nonsense. As I explained, we've had the trust who is fully appointed by government. We've had governors who are fully appointed by government. Rona Fairhead, who is going to be the first chair, is very much her own person, despite the fact that under the BBC Trust, she was uh, appointed through a public appointments process. And an important point, because this has been slightly muddied in recent weeks, the board does not make editorial decisions. So pre-broadcast editorial decisions, which really is what is at the heart of a lot of this, I think. You know, who is going to be making decisions about whether uh, you know, Newsnight should broadcast X or Y? That is not a matter for the board. That will be a matter for the director general. So there really isn't the need for the concern around the independence of the BBC. 
Um, the, uh, the second point you raised about the accountability of the BBC, we don't have long enough for. I mean, you appreciate it's a very complicated issue. The BBC is accountable to license fee payers. It will be accountable to the NAO. Um, uh, it has um, uh, a, a wider set of accountabilities to an international audience that are quite hard to pin down in sort of legal, legal terminology. Um, but the, um, the ultimate accountability in, in the sort of legal language is to the public interest and that will be written right into the heart of, of the Charter, that the BBC exists to inform, educate, and entertain in the public interest, and that won't change. Great. Thanks. Can I have this question and that question, and we'll answer two together, if that's all right? Uh, I have a question about, uh, like, with the EU referendum, I feel like with the public service, it didn't really give much of a... Um, help of deciding in terms of what to choose because I feel like with overall in terms of deciding for the uh, voting it's like um, it failed in terms of preparing the nation to make a fundamental yeah. decision and it's quite important and my question is how would the future for public service prepare for our nation to make a good decision in terms of voting Great, thank exactly you. Right. And then that question. That is exactly the right question. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, probably, I'm a student at the University of Sheffield. I'm probably rare among students in believing fully that I should pay for television if I want to watch it, whether I watch it on demand or live. Um, but I struggle to see my grandparents and older people being given their television licences for free. Uh, and I wonder, having heard Hugh talk so much about transparency, whether that deal, that pre-white uh, paper deal, was conducted in that uh, open and transparent way. Um, brilliant. Can I take that one first? Just because I think the issue of the EU referendum, we could bring the whole panel in. And I'd like Hugh, could you directly say the financial settlement, the you know, three days of talks with George Osborne and John Whittingdale, was that conducted in an open and transparent way? Well, look, as the ministers have said, the, the timing of that was unfortunate. Um, uh, in an ideal world, there would have been the possibility to consider all these things in the round. There was the need to um, make early decisions around deficit reduction, and, uh, and that was the context in which this happened. And I must say, just to bring my own, a bit of my own personal experience to that, a previous job I did in government was working uh, at number 10 on welfare policy. I know the list of options for welfare cuts. And I think a lot of this discussion, I do understand the, the concern around this, but a lot of this discussion happens in the absence of thinking hard around what were some of those other options. And I think if you are ministers forced with some of those difficult choices and trade-offs, it's a much harder decision than it is when we just talk about media policy and events like this. Um, the EU referendum, really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to bring David in at the end, but Alison and Ralph, can you talk about, you know, have broadcasters failed in their duty to actually tell people the truth and uh, give more information about the EU? Well, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of people here. I don't know if Jan, our Head of Current Affairs Commission, is here. I can't see him, but he will be able to testify that I was sort of challenging him on this very subject last night because... Um, it's such an important vote. It is fast approaching on the horizon. And you do still, everyone you talk to says, and you know, you, you think yourself, am I armed with enough information? Am I making an informed decision? So I was challenging, how can we do more? How can we improve the coverage? I mean, he said to me, what's so hard about it is you're predicting unknowns. You're trying to predict what will happen if we go out, what will happen if we stay in, and we're dealing in unknowns. But it, I think the, Lord Putnam has spoken very eloquently about the gravity of, of, of the um, question Britain is being faced with. And, and to your point, I think we need to continue to try and do uh, as good a job as we can. I mean, we've covered it a great deal. We've had a number of um, documentaries. We've had Nick Robinson on it. We've had Jeremy Paxman on it. We've got uh, some debates coming up. We're trying our best, and we will continue to try hard to uh, equip people with the information they need to make. Ralph, decisions. has Channel 4 done enough? Yeah, I mean, Channel 4 has done a lot, obviously, through the news and our current affairs output. I think one of the problems has been that the political discourse has been so uh, black and white and so based in, as David says, a kind of, you know, exercising people's fears and prejudices rather than their intelligence, that, that reporting that, particularly within the 
confines of the election period where we are strictly governed by rules of impartiality, reporting that has been, it's been difficult to go beyond what the politicians are saying uh, and, 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 and really truly inform people about the debate. And, and you know, I think the BBC programmes have been good. I think you know, looking at the Channel 4 output, I could probably point to a few things outside the news and current affairs that have touched on Europe over the years. But yeah, I mean, it's something that should give us pause to think about. Are we covering those things enough? The Ed Morrow clip, raises a slightly different question, which is, you know, when he says, would the American public have, you know, suffered from having a debate about education or about foreign policy, the other question that we always have to ask every night is, well, would they have actually turned up to watch it? You know, we now, we now have an environment of such sort of saturation of choice that every programme that we put on has to be in some way competitive. People, if we just put on very straight debates about Europe every night or very straight programmes about Europe, the danger is that those programmes would be you know, widely swerved by audiences. So how you actually weave those kinds of subjects into the schedule and place them in a, in a, in a kind of mixed schedule where there may be some serendipity of people bumping into it and a flow of audience is really, really complicated. And David, I mean, your, your brilliant clips made the point about sort of asking for this debate, which if they didn't happen in the US, has happened in the UK. You then seem to be suggesting if Brexit wins next Thursday, will the broadcasters be partly to blame? Yes, and I sincerely believe they, they would be. But I think the question that put it perfectly is that over the past 10 years, here's the question to ask yourself, over the past 10 years, have we received an accurate assessment of what it is to be in Europe? Uh, and are we knowledgeable, sufficiently knowledgeable about the role that Europe plays in our lives? And the answer has got to be no. And I'll give you just a couple of, a couple of examples. We've allowed this notion that uh, there's a group of faceless bureaucrats in a vast organisation in Brussels that run, effectively run our lives uh, and probably spend three hours at lunch every day. My experience could not have been more different of working in Europe. Could not have been. Highly intelligent people with a vision, may not be our vision, but it's their vision, with a vision, uh, who work extraordinarily hard. It's a tiny, as Hugh, I think, confirm, a very, very small administration, actually, running with, with, with enormous responsibilities. So we've allowed ourselves to get into a kind of Monty Python mindset over what Europe is and the people who, uh, who operate within it. That should not have ever happened. We'd, we deserve to have and should have been given a far more accurate assessment of what our relationship with Europe is and who these people are and what sort of job they have and indeed what their own vision is. That would be one. The other is, it's been a pretty... So everything's happened in the last two, three weeks, which actually should have happened in the last four or five years. We, the, the, we should have become more knowledgeable. I'll give you another example, and I don't understand this. On my iPhone here, I've got a clip of Boris Johnson doing a programme about Turkey in which he passionately argues that Turkey ought to be part of the European Union, that, it, that there's a prejudice shown against it. It is a passionate argument for Turkey being in the U U European Union. I cannot understand why the BBC, whose programme this is, have not run this clip. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I've, I've got an amber light, and I've left myself with four people that have been waiting incredibly patiently. Um, the woman at the top, and then this man here, um, and the woman there has been waiting about, and there has that woman with her hand up. Can somebody, as soon as this gentleman's finished, can you rush up to there? But please, can you keep your questions really brief? Thank you. Irene Katsiria from the University of Sheffield. Uh, I'd like to bring uh, the discussion back to the concept of distinctiveness, uh, which I think is a very noble concept, but one that has... Uh, sharp and potentially dangerous edge. So recently the BBC removed thousands of recipes from its website. Uh, and um, this has happened in other countries as well, for example in Germany, and there the law says specifically that uh, non-program related press-like content should not be on the website. So it acknowledges that it's about the protection of the press. Uh, if, uh, so I'd like to ask, should we hide behind distinctiveness instead of openly saying that it's about protecting competitors? And does this panel feel that the recipes, which are informative, educate the public and are perhaps entertaining, are not distinctive? Um, Marvellous. I wish... Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> um, let's... 
We'll answer this first. I did say to Alison, prepare for recipes. Um, the one thing I would say, if we just make it about, you know, and I think Hugh and Alison can answer this. Um, there are obviously the good food site remains. So the commercial arm of the BBC will still have all those recipes available online. Yeah, exactly. So the recipes will remain online. The recipe, you know, they are important and people value and they will remain online. But I think you speak to a really important bigger point. When he was talking about uh, the, the programmes he cited when he was talking about the excellence of the BBC, I'm all incredibly proud of um, as a commissioner, you know, the fantastic coverage of David Attenborough's birthday, uh, Shakespeare Live. You could, sorry, you could also point to the World War I coverage. I just think in distinctiveness, we also need to protect a place for, you know, the Great British Bake Off, um, the recipe the finder. The specific question, though, is about should there be a law that says, should actually the white paper have said, if you online compete directly with what the, what the Telegraph are doing, you shouldn't do it? God, I, I, I just... I, or the Guardian, I should say, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I don't think you, I think the, the definition of de distinctiveness is, is, is useful. It's about um, distinctiveness across the service. I think the minute you get into the BBC is only able to operate in areas of market failure, you, you as the public, we as the owners of the BBC would, would be experiencing a vastly diminished BBC and we would be the poorer culturally as a nation for it. Hugh? I'm going to I, 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 I'm resist the temptation to talk about recipes, uh, um, but I, I do feel I'm not... I don't think I've got across enough of this concept of distinctiveness in a way that is kind of cut through. So very quickly, just one example. I went to see Greg uh, James, who, uh, as some of you will know, is a DJ on Radio 1. He spends a lot of time playing good music. Uh, a month ago... No, this is not fair. We're moving away from this question. It's specifically, should the press, should commercial yeah. rivals of the BBC online, I include The Guardian, should they be protected by them being banned to produce recipes, for example, well, which lots of people love? The government has not in its white paper suggested the, government, the BBC should be banned from doing recipes. The BBC has but to make its it? own judgment. Well, it wasn't in, uh, uh, in the white paper. Soft news, the BBC has to make its own judgments about what are the appropriate boundaries of what it should do. And one of those judgments is the nature and extent to which it should be uh, producing recipes. Brilliant. Thank you. Great question, as they all have been, obviously. But this gentleman here, uh, where's he gone? Sir. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Uh, I've got a question for David Putnam. David, how reassured are you by this idea from the Secretary of State that uh, if Channel 4 were to be privatised, that a commercial investor or purchaser could somehow uh, ameliorate the impact on its public service remit by signing up to uh, a voluntary code of conduct? Uh, you know, as an aside, it slightly reminds me <clears throat> of the debate around... Uh, very heated debate about Rupert Murdoch's purchase of the Times and the Sunday Times, when he very generously agreed also to sign up to a voluntary code of conduct and he appointed a board to enforce it. Mm. I think it so lasted less than a year. How reassured are you? I'll ask you both that. If that mic can please go up to the um, woman who's been waiting very patiently there. Um, David and uh, Ralph, how reassured are you um, about the voluntary code of conduct? <laughs> Uh, Nick's answer may, uh, uh, may give the answer for me, which is I have no, I have no uh, confidence whatsoever in voluntary codes of conduct. In my experience, things, if things can get worse, they do. And the commercial world, and I've spent most of my life in the commercial world, is brilliant and very and, and adept at finding loopholes and means to achieve its ends, irrespective of what it may have said at the time that it uh, persuaded government that it was well-meaning. It, it's a joke. Well. Yeah, I, I agree. I find, I find that not at all reassuring because I think it comes down to the delivery of the remit. And I think for those who don't work in public service broadcasting and understand that it's not just something you can sort of categorise things as those are remit programmes or those are non-remit programmes. You know, the remit infuses everything that we do at Channel 4 and it informs everything that we do. So what those who don't work in the sector want to do is say, well, look, you know, we'll, we'll protect, we'll reinforce the number of arts programmes and the hours of news in peak and, and that will mean that Channel 4 will continue to deliver its remit. 
But the remit isn't confined to those things. The remit is the spirit with which we go about making all our programs. And that spirit of innovation sometimes ends up, if you look at programs like Gogglebox or First Dates, they end up looking like quite commercial programs. Well, they weren't commercial programs when someone came into my office with a scratchy sort of idea in the back of a notebook. They were kind of goofy little ideas that we then nurtured and brought into existence and have now become great commercial exports to the UK. First Dates and Gogglebox sell in lots of countries you know, around the world as both tape sales and format sales greatly to the benefit of the producers that make them, and they're commercially successful programs for us. Should we say, well, they're no longer remit programs, so we should sort of give them away or stop making them, or should we spend the money that we make through advertising in them on the next set of remit delivering programs? So that kind of greenhouse effect, I think, is the true kind of essence of our public service sort of, you know, nature. Not just saying we do this number of hours of this and we do that number of hours of that. And it's very, very difficult to see how the code of conduct you know, or a profit-making, you know, organisation could, could really continue to deliver the remit in that way. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take the final two questions. Um, this woman here and then this, this woman there. Two Hi. final questions, please. I just wanted to ask how this would affect young people who end up wanting to work in this industry and work in public broadcasting. Um, I'm going to ask you two to answer that and then this question. Thank sorry, you. it's really... <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, my name is Sylvia Harvey, University of Leeds. Um, I'd like to return to the issue of the unitary board, please. And I think the question that I have probably can't be answered by anybody on this panel. Ah. This is, this is because, <laughs> That's good. That's tricky. <laughs> this is because the public appointments process is not decided by the DCMS. The public appointments process is being dealt with in some other part of the forest, some other part of government, I think. And if you read the comments made by the outgoing Commissioner for Public Appointments in March of this year, he's quoting from something called the Grimstone Report, which I'll bet nobody in this room has ever heard of. I think David probably has. And the, the Grimstone Report makes certain recommendations about changes to the public appointments process. And I'll just read you very briefly. Can you just ask the specific question briefly. that you want to yes, answer? The and then I'll see if there's someone well, on the panel I've that can answer that it. I think you'll find it difficult to answer it. Um, what, <laughs> what Normington says is that the new process, if accepted, will enable ministers to set their own rules. This is the public appointments process. So should, will enable, should, the public, should the appointment of the new unitary board be governed by the Normington proposals? Is that the question? No. <laughs> would enable ministers to set their own rules, override these rules whenever they want, appoint their own selection panels, get preferential treatment for favoured candidates, ignore the panel's advice if they don't like it, and appoint someone considered by the panel that's not up to the job. That, according to the outgoing Commissioner for Public Appointments, is what are the recommendations contained in that report. Just very quick answer. Sylvia, that's exactly why we went to Sir David Normington for his advice, and that's the advice that we've contained in our inquiry, which has been published on the 29th of this month. So I think we have answered, and we've covered your point. And, and, and now all it needs is for the government to agree. Um, could you answer the question? It's always good to end on the future hopes and prospects of young people going into the industry. I think, you know, appealing to young audiences and building young audiences remains a huge priority for us and probably an even bigger priority for Channel 4. Um, so I don't think it impacts um, the potential for people to come in and work. You know, we need, we need young workforce. We need programmes that appeal to a young audience. Yeah, I'd say to any young person joining the industry now, you're joining an amazing industry. It's a really, really exciting, thriving, buzzing. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of work out there. There's a huge amount of kind of you know, highly professional, successful, independent production companies. You've got great big BBC productions, great big ITV productions. It's a brilliant industry to be in. You're, you're going to be working in a great industry that's the envy of the world, right across the board in loads of different genres. So wonderful place to be. It didn't get there by accident. And it's not like that in loads of other countries. Loads of other countries, if you live in Italy, I would not advise you to go and work in TV production. If you live in France, I probably wouldn't either. So, you know, like, just, just remember it didn't get to be this way by accident. And we sort of, you know, let that sort of diminish at our peril. Brilliant. Um, we've covered... We've covered a huge number of topics, but I, I've left at the end of an hour and a half thinking there's so many more questions. Um, thank you so much for being a great audience. But I think um, the, the, the panel itself and the, the topic is obviously really important, but the panel have helped make it really, really interesting and informative. So please could you give a big hand to Hugh Harris, Alison Kirkman, Ralph Lee and David Putnam.
Thank you.